What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Kilo Loco, and I'm here with my friend. Want to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. My name is Iman. Kilo, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, so I went out to your to your house yesterday, and we we got together to watch the WWDC event. We watched um, both the, the keynote and platforms. So yeah, it was, it was a great day. Um, you even showed me some funny YouTube videos, so I really enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah yeah and, and just had a great time overall nice nice i'm really glad you made it out um you know it would have kind of been a bummer to do dub dub alone for a second year straight and uh for those for our audience uh we met in dub dub 2019 which is uh, a blowout um and yeah we've been in touch ever since and you know we thought why not experience dub dub dc 21 together and yeah yup and that's that was the year when like Swift UI had came out and everything was like amazing. That was such that was that was the WWDC to go to. So yeah, we yeah, had that, a really good time. There were multiple massive announcements that year, but let's 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 hone in on this one because I could go on and on about 2019. <laughs> that that year was just uh, it'll live in infamy in my mind. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, I I I totally agree. Um, but yeah, like you said. Let's focus on this year, 2021. What were your thoughts on yesterday's WWDC? I I came away with it uh, pretty happy. I I, I think we're, we're going to be in agreement on a lot of this because we kind of chatted about it yesterday. But like, I love all the new system features that Apple introduced uh, in this release. Um, a lot of new features and a lot of quality of life improvements. Overall, I would say, you know, I was pretty happy with it. Um, but I know you had some uh, things that, you know, you weren't happy about. And I kind of agree with it, too. So you go ahead and share your overall thoughts. Yeah. So, like, overall, like, I was not impressed, like, with <laughs> WWDC. Like, I still get excited thinking about when we were out in San Jose. And granted, you know, being out there in person meeting all kinds of people, having fun, just having that energy is obviously like completely, is a completely different experience. But even the content of WWDC was just like, it was subpar compared to what we experienced in 2019 and even 2020, in my opinion, because at the end of this WWDC, I just, I wasn't super excited about anything. I, I didn't want to rush out to go code anything, to be honest. Don't don't ever compare a dub dub <laughs> to 2019 ever. That that's like one, once every like several decades that's gonna happen. But no, I, I get what you're saying. I, I'm not as down about it because um, as a consumer, I'm extremely happy. As a developer, I'd say I'm still happy, but I get that it, it wasn't as uh, high of a note as the last couple of years because there weren't anything that that's like oh I'm gonna add that into my app. Like, and I relate to you on that. There was no new feature where I'm like, we could use this and I want to dig into it and explore it more. Outside of like Swift UI and Swift concurrency, um, everything else was just kind of like, cool, I can't wait till other apps, you know, use this. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, same here. Like, like last year they had, it wasn't super huge, but they had widgets, right? Mm -hmm. And when widgets came out, like I was super pumped about that and I wanted to race and go use it and figure out how it worked. And this year I just didn't get that same um, thing. So, but like even before WWDC started, before we, we even started watching, I kind of wasn't even feeling it then. Like it just did not, this year did not feel like, or like at least this time did not feel like it was a big WWDC thing. Like it didn't feel energetic to me and i don't know what that was maybe it's just me maybe it's because i'm still a little bit sick but it just didn't feel like it was wwdc time and that like kind of led to me like also not thinking that there was going to be a whole lot announced and i i kind of feel like i was right on that yeah no i i understand where you're coming from uh i, I do think that uh once we dig into like a, a recap and like really go into some of the stuff they announced um i am curious to hear if you're at least curious or, or interested in exploring some of the features they announced because there are a few things that after i let it like sink in i'm like oh that's really cool i can't wait to like mess around with that 
In fact, I have like a, an app idea that I've been sitting on for so long and there's a new view in Swift UI that might be like perfect for what I want to do if I understand it correctly. But yeah, uh, I, I, I get where you're coming from and I understand why someone would feel that way about this year. Yeah. And, and in regards to predictions, like there were so many predictions, especially throughout the community, a lot of big predictions for this event. And for me personally, the only prediction that I had was that other people's predictions just weren't going to come true. <laughs> um, like it was just that I felt like Apple glasses just didn't feel like it was going to come uh, yesterday and it didn't. Like that was like the only prediction that I had. So, I mean, how about you? Like, did you have any predictions about what was going to be, um, you know, presented to us during WWDC that came true or maybe some things that you thought were going to come and they just didn't come through? What about, what, yeah. what did you think? Yeah, there were a few things. Uh, my, my predictions are pretty much anything Mark Gurman says from Bloomberg. Uh, he's been very reliable and, um, uh, I, and I have a pretty good BS uh, detector. Like I could tell when that this rumor is shady. Anytime I see anything about DigiTimes, uh, um, I'm like, okay, that, that's it's not happening or unless it's like supply chain related. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you some of my predictions off the bat. Uh, first one was uh, pretty much all of them actually, now that I think of it, was just iPad. Uh, multitasking for iPad, uh, placing widgets anywhere on the home screen for iPad. Um, and there was like one other thing for iPad. Oh, uh, this one actually was uh, cross-platform. Notifications were getting revamped. Those three things were the main things I had read upon uh, that I recall, and all three of them happened. But think about like compared to any other year, especially like one week leading up to Dub Dub. There's so much more like coming out, and this year it didn't happen. In fact, a lot of people got things wrong this year. Um, yeah. new MacBook Pros and all that. That was kind of a downer. <laughs> the weird thing is that they're probably going to release a new MacBook Pro, but it's just going to fly under the radar. They're just going to, it's just going to be on the website one day and it's going to be like, well, could have talked about it a little bit. <laughs> I really hope not. I really hope not. And the reason why is because it's the, it's like, you know, how the iMac was finally redesigned and it has like a new look. I imagine these MacBooks, because uh, the previous MacBooks with M1 were just the same thing, but with a new chip, right? But the next ones, I expect it to be like a, a hardware refresh. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. I, 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 I am not in the market for a new MacBook, but if it's if it's compelling enough, compelling enough. I might consider getting a new one. Who knows? I'm really, I'm really waiting for like a M1 or an M2 or an M1X or whatever they call it, but like the next version of M1, but for a Mac Pro because I'm really into the desktop thing now, especially being remote, and um, like I, I, I need something that's much more powerful than this little M1 Mac Mini, which I am not too, not too satisfied with. But that's. That's a topic for another day. Yeah, I, I'm. I have so much to say to you about that, but yeah, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and like go through a recap of like everything that was announced yesterday, and let's just kind of give our thoughts on on a couple of these things. Um, you know, they kicked off the event um, mostly talking about FaceTime. So they announced things like spatial audio, voice isolation, grid view. Now. I didn't really care about any a lot of these different features, but the things that really did stand out to me was uh, the FaceTime links. So like the same way that you would be able to have a Zoom link, you could do a FaceTime link. That was like, uh, that, that basically promoted FaceTime from being like, a, just like an Apple only thing to like, kind of like Zoom, like and anyone can use it now, whether you're on Android, uh, get in on it on a browser. But I feel like I, I, I'm excited about it, but I also feel like it would have been so much more useful last year. You know, it's a little late, but I still appreciate it. And I'm glad it's here because FaceTime was just an Apple only thing up until this point. Yeah. And then they also touched on um, SharePlay and the fact that there's going to be a SharePlay API. So um, I really like that. Uh, the, the, that's something that I've been really wanting because especially having gone through the pandemic where everybody's kind of separated and you're not necessarily able to be around a lot of people all the time. 
um, being able to have share play where I can, you know, be watching something on Netflix and then share play that to somebody else. Um, that would be super awesome. And it's, it's an idea that I've had in my head for the longest time. So I'm really happy to see that this capability is being released and that they are like presenting it alongside with the API. Yeah. We, like I like this because a lot of my friends on discord essentially watch things together. Um, I, I am curious to see if Netflix and uh, all these big streaming companies implement these APIs because I feel like they have a fear that it'll reduce their subscribers if one person can just, you know, share things. But I don't really think that's what will happen. Um, yeah, uh, share play. Um, pretty huge deal. Uh, yesterday, we were watching your Practical Jokers, right? And you live a couple hours away. It'll be cool to just, you know, on random nights, just send a link to a friend and watch something together. That'll be pretty fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that show had me cracking up. So I'm definitely <laughs> down to watch with you. <laughs> and then it, like, af and then after um, FaceTime, they started talking about messages. So there's a bunch of little cool things that were in messages and I actually didn't capture a whole lot of notes on it because they were kind of like running through a lot of the different features, but there's like right. a lot of little cool things. Like some of them were included like the collection. So like you'll have like a stack of photos that you can swipe through um that keep like those group messages from getting too cluttered with photos right. and then and then also the uh the shared with you um so i know that was something that you were kind of interested in um like what were your thoughts on it uh playing off what you just said about collections i don't know why it didn't occur to me that it'll declutter messages so much because i hate having like 10 different images and having to scroll past all that so I'm an idiot. Thank you for pointing the obvious out to me. Uh, but shared with you, uh, yes, I I liked the idea behind shared with you, and the reason why I highlighted this as something I want to bring up is because I kind of don't like that Apple um, forces their own apps as being the default place these things go to. So if you send me an article, right, um, and I want to read it later, I have to open up the news app in order to get that link to the article again, right? I'm hoping, <clears throat> pardon, I'm hoping that they open this up like they're doing with other things. So I can say, if anyone text, text me a link, send it to like my re, uh, pocket app or Instapaper or whatever. Um, what do you think? Yeah, like I I don't really receive that many links. Um, so I'm not like super excited about this, but I do sh like have a group, uh, group chat with my family. And we share things with the kids all the time. So having like the the shared with you when it comes to articles that it's usually my mom that shares them with me or my sister, um, having those things where I could go back and like revisit them. I think that's going to be like um, a lot. It's going to be much easier for me to go back and actually revisit those articles because a lot of the times we're just doing things asynchronously, talking about these things asynchronously. And then I'm like, yeah. oh, that's a great article, but I'm not going to read it right now. And then I want to go back and read it and I have to like swipe all the way up and make sure that I don't pass it. Judging by how quickly you text me, I, I get exactly what you're saying. Um, <laughs> but, but, but this is for photos too. And I think anyone can appreciate, like I get a lot of photos and I have to manually save them one by one. If I open photos, it'll just have all the photos that were sent to me and I could just quickly like import whichever ones I want. So that's a that's a big plus for that. But apart from that, I don't know if there's much else to add about shared with you. Just hopefully they open it up to third parties. Yeah, I, I like I said, they, there was like a bunch of little things inside of messages that they improved. But um, like this was one of the things that definitely stood out. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you want to touch a bit on notifications? I know you were interested in that. Yeah, so so with notifications, um, I really like the fact that there was a notification summary that was like generated through um, like machine learning where they are going to curate what they think is the best notifications to show you at the top of the hour or like whenever you set it. So I guess there's some flexibility and customization that you can do there where you're able to say like, okay, I want to have a notification summary at, 11 a.m. on these specific types of notifications. So I'm assuming that these notifications kind of work alongside with focus, which we'll talk, we'll touch on in a bit, but um, allowing you to like see notifications that are relevant and what you want to see at a specific time, I think is like really awesome. Um, I also like the idea of having like 
the silenced notifications, like being able to set specific notifications of notifications to be silenced and for other notifications to come through. Like, cause I've always had this thing where uh, I have a ring doorbell and I want to be able to know if somebody's like walking around the front of my house in the middle of the night. So I kind of want to get that notification in the middle of the night. Um, but like, I don't want to receive like a discord message notification or something like that when I'm sleeping. Right. So there's different notifications that I want to be silenced and there's different notifications that I want to uh, work during specific times and do not disturb doesn't allow me to do that right now with iOS 14. So with iOS 15, I'm really looking forward to that, uh, that functionality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th I feel like everyone's on the same boat. Do not disturb was a great idea, but it's too like all encompassing. And uh, I'm excited to see like having a little bit more granularity and uh, customizing it to fit our own needs. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And then and then there was focus, right? So the ability to kind of um, structure how your apps are laid out during a specific time, what's available to you, what's presented to you and like the layout of all that stuff. So, um, you know, I know that you, you really like the idea of like the work and personal thing. You want to talk a little bit about like how, like what your plans are for focus. Uh, yeah. What, what, you might need to remind me a little bit. Focus was, uh, the ability to define like a category, like work or something like that. And then you get to customize what kind of notifications come through. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, or well, it's not it's not necessarily notifications, but it's like I think it's the layout of your screen, right? So, like, um, or at least that's kind of the way that I understood it was um, during work hours, like let's say nine to five, right? During nine to five, I don't necessarily want to see um, Instagram on my homepage, but from like five to to ten, I want to see Instagram on my homepage or something like that, just like keeping those distracting things away from you while making sure that everything that's relevant for that time slot um, is like, you know, on your homepage or something like that. That's, that's the way that I understood it. Dude, that, that's an amazing feature. I wish I heard about it yesterday. I must've been like, tweet, <laughs> I must've been like typing a tweet or something. Cause I totally missed that. But if that, if that's a part of focus where I come to my desk every day at like, let's say 3 PM to write something and I want, these apps on my home screen that'd be amazing uh i didn't even know about that i thought I, we were just talking about notifications with focus so yeah <laughs> oh well i mean that was my that was my understanding um whether or not that's like the actual case i don't I hope know you're right. but i hope you're right but that's 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 how i understood it and if it is then i hope that uh you know or i'm excited about it because they also talked about having a custom focus where you can like you can set it to be like you know, you can have several different types of focuses, like maybe your day is slotted in a weird way to where it's like, it doesn't fall under work. It doesn't fall right. under personal. Maybe it's like something else like yard work or something like that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But like just having that customization there is uh, kind of cool. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I, I want to check all this stuff out. I'm curious to see if you could only set it on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, can I set it so that on Saturdays uh, only at, at noon, it's a special thing, but not on noon on every other day. So I can't wait till like get the betas. Um, I don't know if I have even a test device to try it with, but you know what? I'll get it on my iPad and I'll uh, think, you know, test it out. So we'll see. Um, do you want to hit the next one where it's, it's still on focus, but you're mentioning something about it being uh, cross platform? Oh yeah. So like, it's just, it's just like taking this concept of having specific apps that are available during specific times, right? But like applying that towards your iPad, right? I mean, I still think of iOS and iPad OS kind of very similarly. So um, I kind of expect that behavior, but they were also talking about having that availability for Mac as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't real, I don't fully understand how it would work with Mac, but I'm excited that it's there. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just in general for this uh, dub dub, I feel like they made good strides in like integrating things and bringing things to multiple platforms. So uh, I'm on the same boat with you uh, there. <clears throat> yeah. And then after that, they were talking about live text. So this was like, this was a interest, 
uh, an interesting feature, but I'm not like super blown away by it, right? And live text was like the ability to take a photo and then um, you're able to copy the text out of that photo and then paste it somewhere else. Or if you take a picture of a phone number, like on the side of a restaurant or somebody's car or something like that, then you'll be able to tap on the, the phone number on somebody's on uh, the phone number inside the picture. And then that will like hyperlink into like, do you want to call this number? Right. Yeah. So it's an interesting feature, but it's not something that I actually see myself using a whole lot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to probably use it even less than how often I use the QR code scanner. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I feel like a, no, no one's going to use it frequently or, or very few people. I think this feature is one of those things where when you need it rarely, it's so nice to have because I imagine this also means I could search uh, text that was in a photo and, and it'll recognize all that too, if they don't do that already. But yeah, the, I, I'm in the same boat with you. This is something that is really complicated and I'm glad they achieved it from an engineering perspective and we'll see when we use it. Yeah, so this was like, so that like brings me to the next point of what they were talking about, right? Which is Spotlight. So this is more, the, the live text is more of a, um, like a symptom of having this Spotlight feature, right? Because even though you might not necessarily go out and take a picture of some text and then copy it and paste it somewhere, um, that might be useful in some cases, but where this really becomes handy is just like you said, and as they kind of talked about it was the ability for, to search for text inside of a photo and then also have photos kind of be classified under that text. Because sometimes um, you might take a picture of a document or something like that. And then you, and you need to take, and you want to find that document again, but like, how do you search for it other than knowing the date? And I've done this before in the past where it's like, I've taken a picture of a document or some type of, um, you know, text, right? And then the only way that I'll be able to find that, doc that, that picture is either scrolling back up all the way, it could be years, um, scrolling back up through years of photos and um, trying to remember where, like when that, that picture was taken, right. or I have to save it to a separate, uh, a separate um, album, and then, and then just like keep those things there. So being able to search for this text inside of a photo, I, I definitely see it as being um, very useful and valuable. It's um, a feature that I seen in Evernote like a couple years ago, but I'm happy that it's brought to the Apple platforms. Yeah, I, I was actually not even sure if that, that, that feature was announced or I imagined it. So it's good to know that it's an actual thing. Um, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Like I, I take t uh, pictures of uh, things all the time and I hate uh, having to dig through the history to find that one thing. And this, this is, this is one of those things where like AI is very practical and uh, I, I see a lot of people getting value out of this. Yeah. I, I definitely think it's going to make spotlight search just that more, that much more useful. Um, I use it all the time on, on my, on my Mac. I even use it on my phone. So I'm loving that it's becoming more powerful. Definitely. Really excited about the ne next few things we're going to discuss. <laughs> so the next, <laughs> the next thing that we're going to discuss is uh, photo memories. Um, just had zero interest in this at all, like zero. Like I don't know what was actually new. I could have sworn that they had music in the memory section already, which memories are a really cool feature for, um, especially like if you have kids, like where you want to see like um, something that happened with your kids or something like that, like a year ago really cool mm -hmm. for that but like music with the memory I, I don't know they were talking about music with memories i don't i, I kind of got bored i didn't take a whole lot of notes on this i don't really know what they talked about <laughs> yeah it's one of those things like i appreciate it but eh, it's, it's not for me i feel like it's for other people uh, i don't know i don't have much to add to this it was just like cool <laughs> next <laughs> <laughs> yeah that one that one i wasn't really impressed with but maybe it's for somebody else now the next the next thing that they talked about was actually really cool, which was the wallet. Now this is like the Apple. They're they're trying to make it so that 
you never need to have your keys or your wallet with you. All you need is your phone and you're able to do everything, right? Mm -hmm. So what they introduced was keys in the wallet. And what they mean by keys is like, you can actually have a key to your house if you have um, a smart lock on your front door. Or if you have a newer car, some of them are going to be working with the keys that are that could be developed for iPhones. Right. And you can open your car with your phone. So mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. But the thing that took it even further was when they announced that you can have your identity, your 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 ID inside of your wallet your like your digital wallet and that is like a real game changer because now you really don't need your phone because you can keep your credit cards in there you can keep your keys in there and you can keep your id in there like as long as you have your phone you're going to be set and i just love the fact that you're going to be able to store your id right there on your wallet and it's always going to be with you. you no more trying to rip it out of that clear plastic part because that that that's just a pain in the butt this is probably one of my favorite features like i oh man i i, I don't know if it's, this is just me you tell me but i hate having things in my pocket especially a lot of things and digging through them um i've always been like a paperless guy and get rid of as many things as i can from my life and uh i've been dreaming of having my id in the phone inside my phone and being being valid everywhere i've been to bars before with like an expired license or I left my license at home. And uh, it's just going to be so nice to have one less thing to carry. Keys I see like um, taking longer to get rid of, but we'll get there and I'll be so excited for that too. The ID thing though, I think it's like, I think they said it was like a per state basis or per city basis, depending on like where you get your ID. I'm really hoping LA is like uh, on board with this already. So yeah yeah i I would guess that california is going to be one of those states um you know but but here's to hoping you know I, as yeah. soon as soon as it's available for me i'm putting my id right there in my wallet yeah and it's i feel like it's it's just more secure in general like if i you know you get mugged or you leave your wallet behind somewhere you don't want someone knowing like your address and you know all your details and i like it like i would sooner rather like leave my phone behind and go back and get it rather than my wallet so yeah, I really appreciate this one. This is probably top five features for me, this dub dub. Yeah, really liked it. So after that, they talked about weather, a bunch of little um, incremental things on weather. I didn't really care. I mean, it's like, how much can you really do to a weather app? It, mm -hmm. It's only, I mean, we were talking about this yesterday, right? Like, as a Californian person, <laughs> you're not going to care about you're not going to care about weather because it's always sunny here. So we yeah. hardly get rain. It's always like 70 degrees or, or, or higher. And mm -hmm. we don't really care about weather. So over here, it's maybe not a big deal. Maybe for somebody else it is, but like there was just some minor improvements there. Yeah. Like, so Apple did buy dark sky out years ago and um, that app was very good at like, telling you oh within the next hour it's gonna rain you know and that's really cool and i'm really happy because a lot of people can uh get good use out of this but yeah like you said in la it's kind of like you know we know when it's gonna rain and it's hardly ever so yeah, uh, yeah. But what else but, we got here but, like uh, but but next they they covered maps mm -hmm. and maps like Maps is very similar to weather in the sense that it's like, how good can you really make it? But Apple Maps has had a bad reputation for a long time. And I I love Apple Maps. Like, I've I've always liked Apple Maps, but I feel like the, the quality of Apple Maps has just improved um, over these past couple of years, like, like tremendously. And then they're like adding a bunch of little things, you know, like elevation and landmarks and things like that and road details. Like, so like you can see crosswalks. Once again, mm -hmm. not something that I'm probably going to take advantage of. But what I really did like about what they announced for for Maps was the um, the AR direction. So just like being able to be at Street View and then have an arrow point like to go to say like oh go this way. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool because this was this is something that you're still probably not going to use now. Like why would you hold up your phone right and right. find out which way to go? 
-hmm. not likely, but it did show that this is probably going to be a feature that's available for Apple glasses whenever they come out. Exactly. And it and it points in that direction that like, oh yeah, this is something that will be like brought to us or that is like forward looking. And um I really like that they incorporated that feature even though it's kind of useless right now. Yeah, I, I agree. Like well once those glasses are out, especially if I'm walking or jogging or something like that. Who am I kidding? I never jog, but I'm walking. Uh, I, I would very much appreciate this. I think it's really cool to kind of not have to look at my watch or my phone to see like where I need to go next. Um, and as far as all the other improvements, uh, I was actually really surprised at how much better they made the the actual geo geography look when you're like uh, navigating somewhere. Um, I didn't even realize you could make it look that good. I like that they called out the landmarks and all that. And you can see like the freeway overpass and all this stuff. I, like We'll see practically if that makes it easier to navigate or if that just gets in the way. But overall, I think it was a, a positive improvement. And it actually has me thinking of going back and giving Maps a second shot. So Yeah. So after Maps, they talked about uh, AirPods. Now, I own AirPod Pros. I don't know where they're at. But I I own AirPod Pros, and um, you know I personally don't really have a problem with them. They're all right. Um, but they talked about adding conversation boost, and I've never really had a problem with like talking to somebody with my AirPod Pros on when it's in transparency mode, right? So I don't really understand what the difference is with conversation boost. Um, apparently, you're supposed to be able to hear people better with co this new feature, but if you have transparency mode on, it always seemed to work for me. I don't know. You got the brand new sexy AirPod Maxes. So I don't know if you if you have a different experience, <laughs> but for me it was just like I don't I don't see what the benefit was here. I'm guessing it's gonna be like because right now transparency is about hearing your surroundings, right? If a car is coming up on me and I'm biking, like I wanna be aware of that so I could, you know, ditch it. Um uh but if I'm if I'm just trying to hear human voice, then maybe conversation boost is like, you know, emphasizes that and boosts only that. And it helps uh, those like hard of hearing. I, I, I like I like that a lot, too. Like anytime Apple's been Apple's been killing it with accessibility in general, with how they baked it in a Swift UI, with the watch stuff they just announced where you could like squeeze and like do all that. And this is just another uh, win for Apple, and I, I really appreciate the stuff. I'm glad they're uh, thinking about these issues and coming up with good solutions for that. Yeah, like I think I think it's probably taking advantage of that same technology that they announced during FaceTime, where it's like voice, um, what is it, voice isolation. So I'm mm -hmm. guessing it might be that. So good maybe point. it's like transparency plus voice isolation, but. Overall, like I personally never had it, never had that problem. But if if they are like focusing on accessibility, obviously that's like a huge win. Um, but the thing yeah. that really stood out to me was like the left behind AirPods, right? Like if you're, I've had this happen before, like where I'm sitting on the couch and my AirPods slip out of my pocket or something like that. And, you know, now I have to go look for my AirPods. Uh, I like the fact that you could get a notification on your phone that says, hey, like, you left your AirPods, you might want to go back and get them. And then also, like, it's easier to find them as well. Like, they have a new way of doing the find my situation for the AirPods. So I really like that, too. Yeah, same. Uh, I feel like it's one of those things, like, I was on a trip recently, and I could have easily left them behind, and that would be a, like, two-hour trip just to pick something up that I shouldn't have forgotten. So definitely a little quality of life improvement, and it's a very thoughtful, small uh, positive improvement. Yeah. So then they had iPad OS and they started off by like showing off the widgets, the super large widgets. I wasn't really too excited about that. It was just like kind of weird. I didn't like them actually. Um, but one of the cool things was that they added multitasking and, mm -hmm. uh, the, like I was even showing you cause I was going to take notes on my iPad that it was just a pain in the butt to do multi multitasking. And I know that was like one of the things that you were like really looking forward to. Yeah, because I feel like the main issue I have with iPads is, uh, aside from the lack of pro apps, I feel like that's getting fixed by developers, is window management 
And I hate like not being able to quickly switch between things, combine things and all that. And this is, oh man, like I can't believe the iPad has lasted this many versions without, uh, without this solution. But um, I, I very much look forward to messing around with this because I think it's the biggest pain point on the iPad right now. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and they also talked about um, notes and I like, I don't really see myself using notes too much more after the improvements that they made, but I did just like, I wanted to give it like an honorable mention because it did seem like they were trying to gear it towards um, a more collaborative platform. So I just like the fact that they included things like mentioning like other oh, right. um, collaborators like that are on the notes and then having like an activity view to where like you could see when somebody updated something like that. So um, I thought those were really cool. And then the fact that you could do the quick note. Now the quick note, that thing like completely blew my mind. And that's something that I will use, like the ability to just have your pencil drag from the bottom corner and then pull a like a, a sticky note out of nowhere and then write on it and then put it away. Like I thought that was amazing. So that feature I'm definitely going to be using. <laughs> uh, I, I, I loved it too, but uh, it's one, it's another one of those things where I'm like, I hope they open this up for other note taking apps to take advantage of. I use Bear right now, uh, and you know I would love to be able to use my iPad for all these things, but you know it's not integrated to the system, so I can't. Yeah. So after after they finished talking about notes, then they kind of uh, switched gears, started talking about uh, Swift Playgrounds. Um, I thought this was interesting. My thought process behind this is like they're building up Swift Playgrounds in place of adding Xcode to iPad. Um, from my perspective, it seems like what's going to happen is they're going to continue to improve on Swift Playgrounds. Then it will finally get to the point to where it's like production ready. And they kind of they kind of already made it that way by giving you the ability to have autocomplete. So now you can have code complete on your text when you're building out Swift UI apps. And then you can also submit your app to the app store directly from playgrounds, directly from playgrounds. And then um, that like makes it so that you can actually work on your iPad and release an app using iPad only. But I feel like they're gonna continue to build up Swift playgrounds to the point to where it's able to do everything that Xcode does. And then they'll just create a pro version of Swift playgrounds, call that Xcode, and then you'll have Xcode on the iPad and a new Xcode on the Mac. It definitely felt like a precursor to uh, like a fully featured Xcode. And I agree with you. I think Xcode is too complicated to like port over with all its existing features. It's a very old app and it comes with a lot of different customizations, too much to like account for every like different flow and outcome. So yeah, hundred uh, percent. Like I see what you see here. Uh, and as far as autocomplete goes, what was the feature with that? Like, What's different with autocomplete now? So I think the I think the idea here is like, you know how you couldn't really build an iOS app without having autocomplete because you're not going to remember the long table view delegate name, right? You're not right, going to spell course. it all correct. So mm -hmm. like having that ability to do autocomplete, but it's only for Swift UI from my understanding. Having that ability to do autocomplete will allow you to actually get these name these naming conventions for your functions and your classes and all these other things. Um, spelled correctly so that you're able to actually build an app that does compile. So is that to say, because I thought Playgrounds already did have autocomplete. So is that something new or is it just adding Swift UI to the mix? You know, I actually don't use Playgrounds um, like at all. So I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if they were saying autocomplete was added at, like for Swift UI, because I think that is something that's new where you're able to build a Swift UI app and like run that app like in your iPad. So I think maybe that's what they were saying um, because I know that they did have some autocomplete, um, but I didn't, I don't know to what extent it was, but it was one of the things that they did bring up is that autocomplete was added. Loosely related. Uh, I, I recall like, you know how like you want to style a Swift UI view, you, you'll have to create a, a pass in a struct like list style, XYZ style, you instantiate a struct. Mm -hmm. They did add static uh, variables or constants uh, that make it like an enum now. So instead of having to look up all the 
structs that conform to this uh, style type, um, all I have to do now is just do dot and it'll list all the variables that conform to that protocol. So maybe that's a part of what they meant with autocomplete. And I do think that's a big improvement because one of the things I don't like about Swift UI is anytime I want to style something, I have to search all the structs that conform to that protocol. And I hate that. So yeah, it might be that. Yeah, that's something that, that I, I know that they improved a little bit um, with the new, the, the new updates towards Swift UI is having the enum um, conventions because searching for a struct that conforms to a style is just a pain in the butt. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, totally, yeah. totally agree. I, I think, I think everything's heading in the right directions for playgrounds. Um, agree. But next they started talking about privacy and this is a part where I fell asleep. So I don't know if you want to uh, share some of your thoughts on, on it. Yeah, real quick. So this is something that I'm going to switch back to mail uh, just for this, these features. So when you open an email, the sender knows you opened it. So if if someone's marketing to you, and uh, like I, I hate opening marketing emails because when you open it, they go, "Oh, this person's active. They're they're looking at our stuff. They're interested." And then they'll send you more stuff. And I hate that. Um, so one of the features they announced here is that no longer will the sender know whether or not you opened the email they sent you. They won't know the IP address uh, you used to open it. Uh, they won't even know your location. So all these things were, were data that senders got. And I, it's it's insane to me that all this information is available to this day. It's kind of like we got used to all our data being stolen from us. And now Apple's just trying to kind of bring our attention to all this stuff. So this is in the mail app, all these new features. And uh, another uh, feature that they announced was um, I think this is like related to iCloud Plus, but um, you can now create like disposable emails and give it to different companies or entities. And um, anytime you're sick of them and they keep spamming you, you just kind of like deactivate that email and you won't get all this stuff forwarded to you anymore. I hate having cluttered email and I hate getting spam. And it's something I've been trying to deal with for a long time. And I can't tell you how long I've been waiting for something like this. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I'm I'm like one of the people that has just like really gotten used to like all that data collection. So that's why I'm saying like privacy hasn't like really stood out to me. But like the one thing that did kind of stand out where they were kind of talking about privacy still was the health aspect of it. And I, I liked that they were like making these improvements in health. Um, but like, I guess it's like kind of the reverse of privacy where it's like you're sharing stuff. So the thing that I like that, that they kind of mentioned about health was like all your, all your health data is private until you choose to share it with somebody. And I found that this was, um, really helpful because like it will, your, your watch can collect all kinds of data on you. And then you can choose to share that data with a healthcare provider, or um, maybe you're the um, the like the the caretaker of somebody, um, you know, whether that be like a, a relative or like one of your kids or something like that. You can share, you can have like the family's health shared as well, and then um, like just kind of keep track of how things are going within the family, making sure that everybody's healthy, knowing when to schedule like doctor's appointments and things like that. Um, so. These were like some of the things that um, I, I was really interested in under the privacy thing is that like, yeah, everything's encrypted and secure until you want it to be shared. And then having that ab the, the ability to share it, I thought was like really impressive. Yeah, it, it's really well done. Uh, I like that there's granularity and like I want to share my heart related info to my doctor, but not necessarily like you know, my exercise information, I don't know, like stuff like that. Uh, another thing I, I appreciated that I'll just quickly mention is the, the better lab results. I, I really like how they, um, when you get your lab results, you kind of don't know what all this stuff means and how, how high or how low a number is bad or good. Um, and they, they kind of added more information around that. So you can actually do something with that information and understand where you are in terms of your health as well. So after the, after that, after the privacy, they started talking about watch OS eight 
Um, there's a bunch of little things that they added. Most of the stuff I'm just not interested in. They added more workouts. They added a couple of different apps that I wasn't going to care about. And then they touched a little bit on messages. But like I said, it just wasn't like anything really noteworthy. Nothing big, nothing big. But I, I will say that we both actually really liked how they made uh, scribbling and dictating and everything in one place. Uh, I thought that was really cool. And, you know, it's convenient not to have to switch between different contexts to do something that simple. Yeah, I think that's probably the only thing that I'll use for this next update, to be honest. Like, just the fact that you don't have to scroll down in order to start scribbling. Same. I think, same. I think that's about it. Right on. Me too. So, so then after that, they went over to, to home, which I thought was like a really weird type of category because... They ended up lumping in the HomePod, which obviously makes sense with the Home, but like they lumped in TVOS and like some of the changes with TV there. Mm-hmm. And it, and I could kind of understand that because there wasn't like a whole lot that they actually added to the TV outside of like the share play um like capability. So I do I, like I said I'm I'm excited about that. Um they announced share play with FaceTime I don't know if you actually have to be on FaceTime in order to use SharePlay or how that actually works, but it is something that I am interested in. Like I said, I want to be able to watch something with friends um, or family or or what have you. Um, so that was something that I did like. Um, but the biggest thing that that stood out to me about like this whole entire home section was the ability to unlock your door with keys. So that was like kind of something that they announced as well with the right. wallet and. Um, like everything else that they were talking about was mostly around um, the home mini, the home pod mini, uh, which I don't own. It's just like, for me, it's too expensive to, to invest into that ecosystem, that, that little home ecosystem. I, I have a home pod mini. I think the, the cool thing there was the voice recognition part. I thought they already had that, but apparently not, or maybe they had it in a limited capacity. Um, it, it, I, I will say this about the home section in general, though, it's interesting because of like how they lumped Apple TV with home that kind of says to me, like how Apple is thinking about Apple TV going into the future. They might be viewing it as like some sort of home hub. And there have been rumors that eventually they'll release like a, um, like a home pod type device, but that also has a screen and that'll kind of be your home device. And I'll be interested to see if that also becomes your TV device at the same time. This is highly speculative, and I'm not saying, oh, I'm sure this is going to happen. Um, we'll see. But it, it does seem like Apple TV is becoming more and more like one of their home devices, and home is the main thing here. HomePod Mini, Apple TV, and all these different products are just you know, different iterations of like a home accessory, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, they'll release a, a a physical Apple TV, like it's an actual TV. And then the awesome part about that is like the stand is going to cost $1,000 alone. So oh, you'll have oh, like yeah. this 60-inch TV that if you wanted to put it on your wall, like on your wall unit, then you have to buy a $1,000 stand or the kicker will be like, you know, $2,000 wall mount. You, oh, you, you, it's cute that you think it'll only be a thousand dollars for the stand. <laughs> that, that was for a monitor, dude. We're talking 60 inch. <gasps> Try oh 5G's. No. Terrible. Oh, man. <laughs> the things they do is crazy. I know, um, I know. So that was the home section, but then they talked about uh, the Mac OS section. And this is like where they kind of just lumped everything else in, right? So they started talking about their new operating system, which is Monterey. And as soon as I saw the design for this, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, they're not going to do anything special for this release. Because Apple always has that thing to where, like, whenever they do the incremental updates, that they Mm -hmm. keep the the background very similar, right? And the, like, for Big Sur, the background was, like, those weird wavy colors. And they were, like, vibrant colors, right? Both Monterey... It was the same. It was the same type of design, but it was just like darker colors. They weren't as vibrant. Mm. So, like as soon as I saw that, I knew that they weren't going to do anything special, like anything too crazy. It was just like a one of those incremental updates. But like the thing that did blow me away was like universal control, right? And that was something that I think it blew your mind even more than it blew my mind. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I work at my desk a lot. I have multiple devices open. In fact, I've been wanting to get an iPad on my desk to use as like a third monitor. And this kind of like increases the value of an iPad by a lot for me. Uh, it, it's it's not just the tablet. It's also my uh, third screen that I could seamlessly use with my peripherals. Like what they showed, like basically you can use both the keyboard and mouse across different devices so what they had was like an iMac and then a iPad on sitting on the desk and they could drag and drop things like from one device to another and this isn't the iPad um, uh, just being a screen it's still on iPad OS that's the interesting part uh, it's iPad OS but you can use that little touch cursor that they added last year and it just switches seamlessly between the two OS's and it becomes an iPad cursor versus a Mac cursor. I thought it was really well done and uh, I can't wait to like try this out. Uh, how excited are you about this? Like, do you, do you see yourself using this like on your desk or do you even own an iPad? I don't even know. Oh yeah, you do. do. You're taking I mean, your notes. Yeah. 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 So I don't, I don't think that I'm going to actually use this uh, a whole lot. There like, um, yeah, I just don't, I don't think I'm going to use it a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of apps that I use across the different platforms. And from computer to computer, it's only code that I share. And that's all managed by, you know, Git. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's just me. It's just me. Okay. <laughs> I, I like it, but I, I don't, I don't think that I'm going to use it. So. Cool. So then there was also uh, shortcuts for Mac, which I think was uh, a really cool thing. Uh, the thing that I'm just like most interested in is making sure that they allow me to access shortcuts from the terminal and if i can do that i'll be happy yeah i saw that they have it on like the menu bar of the mac so you could add like five shortcuts in one little icon and like a shortcuts icon and go through and pick things i hope that they have it in the terminal too because i know a lot of people love running automations and scripts straight from terminal i'd be surprised if they didn't include it or if there wasn't a way for you to do it yourself so yeah yeah and then after that, they started talking about Safari. Now, I personally love Safari. I, I wish I could use it all the time, but I can't. So I never use it. Like every time I try to open up websites that aren't just like regular HTML and CSS, there's always some type of problem with Safari. So mm. I prefer Safari, but I never use it anymore. So yeah. How long ago were you using it? How many years? Uh, Months. It was just months, months ago. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, it's it's funny because for me, ninety nine point nine percent of the websites I go to work fine, but there is definitely some times where I'm like, why is this website not working? Why am I not able to do this thing? And it's I try a different brow browser, and lo and behold, it starts working. Um, but yeah, no, I, I get where you're coming from on that. I use Safari and Tab Groups uh, specifically were like the standout feature for me. Uh, I think they said extensions for iPhone and iPad, but really the main thing for me were the tab groups. And here's why I tend to open like a hundred tabs of, around a specific topic. Let's say I'm looking at buying new shoes. And for some reason I need to overthink this and buy the perfect pair of shoes for me. I have 20 tabs open. Now I can just put them in a group and then access them across all my different devices when I need it. And just kind of have that decluttering effect without feeling like I'm losing something that I found that's valuable. So yeah, that, that that's exciting for me. And we'll see maybe like, this is such a good feature. I could see like Google and uh, uh, Mozilla adopting a similar thing in their own browsers. Yeah, um, it definitely looks useful, especially to clear out all those Stack Overflow tabs for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know that life. <laughs> And then um, they, they talked about Swift concur concurrency, uh, something that I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, I work with uh, Flutter a lot, so there is um, concurrency, uh, the same concurrency features that they announced in Swift with the uh, mm -hmm. Away and the Async. Um, mm -hmm. So those two features are, are going to be added to Swift. Um, I look forward to it, but I know that you haven't been able to work with that type of feature set before. No, I've, I've, I've seen, I watch like tutorials from other languages just to kind of learn uh, best practices regardless of, you know, whether it's Swift or not. I've seen JavaScript users use uh, async await, I think. I think it was JavaScript. And it, it's kind of, 
I, I feel like I've always looked over and the grass is always greener. Like all, all these other languages have these conveniences. And I'm so happy now that we get to kind of get rid of all that headache and clutter that came with completion handlers and all that nesting. It was just so hard to reason about and so error prone. And this kind of removes uh, and introduces a lot more safety in the Swift. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is huge and I love it. Yeah. And um, they they talked about uh, App Store. You have in-app events, so that's another thing. But the thing that I really enjoyed was uh, the Xcode Cloud, like just being able to have a CI CD pipeline that you can build that's native to Xcode and runs all your tests and, and goes through the operation. Because um, I've worked with uh, Jenkins before, and boy, is there like a lot to learn. So... It was just like one of those things where like I'm excited about having a native solution and mm -hmm. I, I I really can't wait to get my hands on Xcode Cloud. Same boat as you. We use Jenkins at work and uh, Apple bought Buddy Build years ago and for a while like it just wasn't showing up and I, I kept thinking they're going to eventually release something like this and um, recently I started thinking like maybe this is just internal like they wanted to buy it and use it for Apple, like their own employees. Uh, so I'm really glad to see Xcode Cloud actually being uh, a product that they're releasing to everyone. Uh, it sounds like they were dog fooding it internally up until this point. Uh, I really want to see what the price is like though. Uh, and I, I'm really crossing my fingers that there's like a free tier because uh, I want to do some like indie work on the side and I don't want to pay uh, you know, significant money on something that's just like one project on the side. So, yeah. What, what do you think? Do you think they'll offer like a free tier or is it all going to be priced out? So if I had to guess, it would be um, essentially free for developers, uh, for indie, indie developers up to a certain extent. Like they would have generous limits is my guess. Mm -hmm. But then after after that, then they're going to charge. And I think it's going to be a fair charge for uh, teams. Uh, um, based off of what I've seen with Apple in the past, I would guess that it's probably going to be the most cost efficient option um, compared to third parties. You said something uh, very interesting. You said teams. Uh, a lot of companies make products available for individuals for free. But then as soon as you want to like use it with others, like you want to share this project and uh, do CI with it, then at that point they'll start charging here's fingers crossed that they actually like um you know make it free for individuals and charge for teams i think that'd be a good approach yeah um and then uh like then it's gonna like really encourage people to actually write tests so i think that's like it's it's really contributing to um, the culture behind what developers are used to doing and um, following best practices and building tests into their projects. So really look forward to that. Yeah, there's too much to do as a developer. And I feel like you don't want to like switch your context over to just getting a build out and all that stuff. It's nice when you just kind of merge something through a PR, everything just kind of takes care of itself and you could focus on your next story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the very last thing was uh, test flight for Mac. Just the ability to have test flight and do some beta testing on Mac apps as, you know, these Swift UI apps become more readily available um, and make uh, cross-platform within the Apple ecosystem uh, more viable. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, like I feel like ever since M1 Max came out, you, you're starting to see a lot more focus on Mac as a platform from Apple. And I, I really appreciate it. I like that they're adding more apps and you're showing the Mac a lot more love lately. And this is just another example of that. Um, I think that, that about covers it, right? Yeah, so that pretty much covers like the entirety of, you know, WWDC. Um, overall, I felt like it was like, overhyped this year i didn't i didn't really care about like everything that they announced it seemed more like it was geared towards consumers and overall i'm happy as a consumer but like as a developer it just doesn't make me excited about anything and um i will definitely probably i will definitely be forgetting about this wwdc compared to the the most recent ones uh, that that just passed 
I, I, I'm more excited than you are. Uh, I, I think the additions, they, one, the concurrency with Swift, and two, the improvements in Swift UI. There, there were significant holes that were plugged this year. But yeah, there wasn't something like new, like widgets that you need to go and build. Uh, so I, I understand where you're coming from as well. How would you rate from a scale of one to ten uh, this dub dub? Um, this dub dub, I would give it probably like a six. Wow, like a, a six. six. Yeah. So below average. Below average. No, oh, wow. I guess no, maybe a seven. It's like an average WWDC, right? Before, okay. before, um. Before uh, the Swift UI one, right, before 2019, they were kind of like this, and that was like average for a while, right? And then uh, WWDC 2019, when they released Swift UI and all that, all that jazz, um, that was like a 10, right? So, and then I feel like last year was like an 8, right? Like, it could have been better, even though it was all digital, but it still could have been a little bit better. So yeah, I would say it was good as a, like I said, it was good as a, as a consumer. So, but not so great as a, as a developer. So I'll, yeah, I guess a seven. So average, not below average because there was still some good stuff. If, if I didn't care for it as a consumer either, then yeah, definitely a six. Gotcha. Yeah. I think if I had to give it a score, I'm I'm more I'm more uh excited than you. I think I'm between seven point five and an eight, uh, but I wouldn't go above eight for sure. I I think it was average to slightly above average, and uh, you know I'm excited for the new APIs. I have some ideas I want to execute on, but I I definitely agree. A lot of this stuff is consumer facing, but even as a consumer, like I'm so excited for like a lot of the stuff they announced, like with SharePlay and stuff. So, yeah, uh, seven point five slash eight got it yeah so strong seven low eight maybe but overall it was, it was a good experience for you yeah yeah definitely, definitely. i think it was yeah. just because i think it was just because i was there you know it was just because i was there that made it oh oh, oh oh you you, you made it h to an eight okay since you were there yeah, i'll say yeah, i'll lock yeah. i'll lock it in at eight points for you there had you been sitting there by yourself right it, have it would have been boring. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do I do think I, I know you're joking, but I do think there's something true to dub dub being a communal experience. And uh, you know, I I've done dub dubs majority of my life alone. After 2019 and flying out, I'm like, oh no, like I need to do this with other people. It's it's uh not not for networking purposes so much as it's just more enjoyable that way. You get excited, you talk about things, you know. Uh, like we're doing here now and you know uh, it's it's kind of a bummer just doing all that solo yeah like having nobody to share it with is definitely a bummer um last year i was still kind of like um it was still a little bit isolated but there was some good stuff in there so um i was excited about what was released so when i didn't have that strong connection with people that that watched it and we watched it together or something like that um you know at least i was still excited about the technology and that kind of um made it a really good experience for me but this year like had i been watching it alone i would have been like oh that, that you should have just sent me an email so yeah i hear you <laughs> but yeah okay so that's gonna be it for today everybody thank you for coming to join us um once again i'm kilo loco this is eman um you know you want to want to let people know where they could reach out to you if they want to if they want to talk to you or you're sure. like nah i don't need friends <laughs> no no it's, it's fine i actually uh I, i'm on twitter at eman harud so e-m-a-n and harud is h-a-r-o-u-t and uh same for my website emanharud.com that's where you can find me got it and i'm kilo loco you can find me at kilo underscore loco on uh on twitter so feel free to reach out as well so that's going to be it for today thank you everybody go out there and keep coding passionately thanks Kyle.